This is the Absolute Business Mindset podcast, created and hosted by Mark Hayward. This podcast will interview entrepreneurs, business owners, and people in their careers. We will delve into their journey, success, key life milestones, and go deep into their area of expertise. Get ready to learn from other successes and failures. Today, we have Will Nitzer, who is the founder and CEO of IQ Bar. Hello, Will. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me. Um, So we're going to talk about your business in due course, but we're going to go straight back to your education, which was a degree in government and psychology. Now, not the most natural fit of two subjects, I would initially think. Um, but why did you choose those those two uh, subjects? Uh, well, in short, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I um, at Harvard, there's a, a, a kind of at every school, I, I think there's a major that allows you to take a ton of different stuff. Right. Kind of study a ton of different uh, disciplines to see what you want to do. Yeah. Um, you know, some people figure it out by like uh, sophomore year, your second year of college, and they want to be an engineer, or, you know, computer scientist or whatever. But yep. if you haven't really figured it out, government is just kind of one of those catch all majors where you can take, you know, sociology, psychology, political science, math, et cetera. Um, right. So it's kind of the, the major you, you pick if you don't know what you want to do. And then, um, late my, my second semester, uh, second year, I took a psychology class and just fell in love with that, that topic. And so I, I, I had to take every class I could on psychology and neuroscience. Um, and so that was really my passion through, through college. But, um, so that, that's why you had that kind of odd, odd coupling. And, uh, and, and what was, what was it in psychology that fascinated you so much? I mean, part of it was the the teacher was just excellent. Uh, it's this guy Dan Gilbert. He's a pretty pretty well known guy now. Um, and the the like rock star in the department is this guy Steven Pinker. Uh, but Dan Gilbert's now gained a lot of uh, uh, accolades himself. But he just, he was just super compelling. And so I mean, psychology is one is just to me just inherently interesting. I mean, like why people do the things they do is yeah. can all be traced back to just neurochemistry effectively and you know people are odd odd in many many ways and manipulatable in many many ways and you know that's just always always fascinated me and so I think it was a combination of just an inherent interest and um and really really good teaching okay moving on you then went into a sales and marketing role at power advocate so so why then sales? I can kind of see the the sort of psychology of sales might be something that would interest you. Was that the reason why you took on the sales role? Uh, again, I so I didn't know. I, I got really interested in psych and neuroscience. I didn't know how to turn that into a, a profession um, because I didn't want to be in. I didn't want to be in academia. I didn't want to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, so. I, Similar to the the not knowing what I wanted to study in college thing, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do professionally out of out of college, right? And so I knew what I didn't want to do. A lot, most of my friends went into finance or, um, you know, finance or or cons- consulting. Um, some into law, some into medicine. I, I knew I didn't want to do any of those things. Um, and so just kind of by default, I took a job at in software, uh, in sales and marketing. Um, and it was a great, great experience. I was not at all passionate about the, you know, software or even the industry we were selling into. I was selling software to oil and gas companies, but, um, what I did benefit from was just those, you know, base skills like Excel, PowerPoint, how do you run a meeting? How do you, how do you send a good email? Um, how do you have a compelling pitch in, in a room with someone who's twice your age, you know, like all of those things, uh, cutting my teeth in all those areas was instrumental to, to giving me the confidence to then strike out on my own afterwards. Interesting. Do you think working in sales has helped your, your current business IQ bar? Um, yeah, I mean, to the extent that, that sale, I mean, everything sales, right? Mm -hmm. When you apply for a job, you're selling yourself. Um, the, you know, sales is one of the, um, pieces of best piece of advice I ever got was, um, from my old boss of mine. He said, 
out of college, you should, there really you should only do one of two things. You should learn how to build something or learn how to sell something. Uh, effectively, you know, that's all that matters. And then things get layered on top of that marketing and things like that. Yeah. But really you should learn how to build something or sell something. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, when you raise money, you're selling the vision of your business um, obviously sales is, is also what most people think of sales is selling to a customer, which is important. Um, but it, it permeates everything. So I think it was immensely, uh, immensely important, um, and, and helpful throughout uh, my entrepreneurial journey thus far. Okay. Fantastic. And you did say one of the, the I asked you, uh, what no one else knows you were a New Jersey state chess champion. Yeah, I was. I was. Uh, That's pretty impressive. I, I like to. Yeah, I like to say I peaked in middle middle school. But um, yeah, I got really into chess randomly. Uh, there was oddly just like a really good chess program at my middle school, and um, yeah, I, I was like games. Um, and it was just one of those things where I'm super competitive, and I kind of just got into it, and it was a fun, you know, fun for me in my pastime, and then that just sort of snowballed i got pretty good at it and then i and then i got a coach and then i started going to tournaments and um yeah that was like the pinnacle uh but yeah i was like you know i would go to like houston texas for the nationals and oh, it's a weird it's a weird scene like the competitive <laughs> chess scene um but it was fun it was you know it was fun so just, just just describe it to me because um i, I want, want my audience to to think about this so so what what constitute com- competitive chess? What what type of people do you have there? We, I assume you was you were staying in like like a hotel or you were up in a hotel in into a, like just just describe to me your your uh, one of your events, your tournaments. Yeah, I mean, if if anyone's done you know competitive sports or is a parent of a kid in competitive sports, yeah, you kind of get it. Like it's it's all the same principle. It's like you go and you stay in a crappy hotel. <laughs> You know, there's this like musty like convention center yeah. uh, type thing, and but the, the the difference with like a mental game versus a physical game is it's all indoors. You know, you're holed up in the, like some random you know room, like going over, um, you, you know, prior games, trying to like it's it's all what's different about it versus sports is it's all mental, it's all psychological. Hmm. Um, and so it's just about mental fortitude and, and preparation. Um, and I don't know, it's just a battle of the minds, which is fun. I've, I played competitive soccer my whole growing up too. So I can like juxtapose the two and it's just, it's mostly like mental fortitude and stamina. You're, you're sitting down next to some random kid from like Kansas or whatever Hmm. for like four hours or five hours. And you know, you make a move and you wait 20, 30 minutes for them to respond, right? So you're just staring at them. You stand up, you walk around, you eat a chocolate bar. Like it's, there are all these weird mental games that you're playing with each other. Um, I don't know. It's hard to explain. It's it's unlike, unlike anything in the physical sports world. Is it, it like, do you play poker? Is it, is it sort of like I've played poker with friends and things like that. And there is definitely a mental side of, of that. Like, do you play poker? I don't, but I'd I'd love to get into it. I play <clears throat> I play blackjack, which is of course a, a lot less nuanced. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I've always wanted. Uh, people speak so fond. Like a lot of the people I respect a lot and listen to a lot are big poker players. So I, I know it's something I. If I got into it, I I would become obsessed with it. Um, <laughs> but I haven't. I just I don't know. There's not enough hours in the day for me at this point. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Um, so we're going to go into your business now, but before we do, um, I wanted to flag, um, in the notes that you, you provided to me that you, the sort of inspiration for your business was based on having chronic, uh, illness, like a brain illness where you had mental fatigue and headaches. So just fill out a little bit more about what you suffered from and, um, and, and I suppose like eventually like what, what, what made you better from, from that chronic illness? Yeah. And it wasn't even like, you know, I wouldn't chronic illness, I guess is uh, maybe technically true, but 
not to over dramatize it. I, I mean, I think I went through what like many, you know, millions and millions of people go through, which is I had a bad diet and I felt terrible, you know, on a daily basis. I think people get used to feeling kind of terrible and they just think that's like, that's the status quo. Like that, that just mm-hmm. is how a human feels on a daily basis Mm. Um, because they're just putting bad nutrition into their body every day. Um, and, and they think that it's just normal to get sleepy in the afternoon and it's just normal to be lethargic. And, you know, if you get headaches, like that's just a thing that happens to some people. And, you know, the reality is, I mean, while, while some of that may, may be true, I found the, you know, the vast majority of it to be nutrition related. So I would have, I had all those you know symptoms and I just kind of felt bad physically. I'd get headaches, I'd have brain fog. Um, and so, you know, it was, you know, it can really only be a couple of things outside of genetics, which, uh, you know, which is food and sleep and exercise effectively. It's, it's kind of like back to the basics. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's just remarkable what you can it's remarkable by changing the things you eat, like how everything else changes, like your, your energy changes. You can think faster, you can talk faster, you can, you know, exercise more, more easily. Like it, it, um, and this was, I was feeling this way at the time when paleo was really getting big and diets like whole 30 were really getting big in the U S and, um, and so I, I just, you know, simply started cutting carbs out and eating more whole food diets, uh, more, more of a whole food diet. And I mean, just everything got better. Um, but I, I was always mostly interested in the cognitive, uh, impact. You know, I'm like in my mid thirties or mid twenties at the time. And it's like, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not competing for, to be the best men's league soccer player. Like mostly what I care about is like, you know, cognitive thinking, well, having good mood, good psychology and being productive every day. Mm. So I was mostly interested in the, the, the cognitive effects of, of good, good or bad diet. So before we go into the cognitive, but just, just, just uh, what, what drove the re- removing carbs from your diet? Was that sort of research? Like, did you, did you read that, 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 that would have an impact on your, uh, on, on, on mood and, and sort of energy levels? Um, sort of where, where, did, where did, did you deduce that after a period of time of trying different things out and it was just that lowering your carb in your diet, your carbs in your diet actually had a major impact? Uh, well, the first thing was I read this book called uh, Grain Brain by Dr. David Perlmutter, which was, um, I think I just, it came up as like an Amazon like recommended thing. I don't even I think that was how I found it. But anyway, I read it and it like totally blew my mind. And the basic concept of the book is basically you're, there are no nerve endings in your brain, right? So if someone punches you in the gut, you feel it because you have nerve endings there. Mm-hmm. Um, but you don't know when you're hurting your brain. Like your brain could be inflamed and all day long and maybe you get a little, you maybe get lethargic or tired or whatever, but there's, there's not a pain response. Right. Um, and so basically via diet everyone's brain is on fire all day long and they don't know it that they don't they don't they're not putting it together and the root of that is carbohydrates effectively um so you know it's like he you know he walks you through the basic physiological process you eat a, a loaf of like he has one really compelling example where he puts up a powerpoint slide and it's like a it's like a tablespoon of sugar um two slices of bread, banana, and like an egg or something. And he's like, what do you think increases your blood glucose level the most out of these four things? And of course, you know, everyone's like, oh, the sugar or whatever, but it's the bread. So it's like, you know, it's, um, sugar is, you know, villainized, but carbs more broadly are are much less so. And basically the bigger story is carbs, period, inclusive of sugar, and when you eat carbs, you know, that turns into blood sugar, which spikes your insulin response, which uh, effectively uh, causes you to store more fat and and um, and have energy spikes that lead to energy deficiencies. And then you get hungry and you need to eat more carbs. Right. So it's it's a, it's also it's not just bad in, in, of, in and of itself. It's bad in that it's a vicious 
cycle and the downstream impact cognitively is when your brain's on fire for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you know, you're more likely to develop Alzheimer's, uh, you, you know, um, Parkinson's, like any neurodegenerative disease. Mm-hmm. And basically he makes a case, he correlates, you know, decades of carbon take to these terrible downstream effects. And we just say, well, that was genetic. You know, I must've been predisposed to get all, Alzheimer's. So, and it's like, no, no, you just ate a terrible diet for 50 years. Um, so anyway, that was what really kicked it off for me. And cognitively, you said about that, what, what, what does, what does, what do carbs do? Is that regarding the insulin levels and things like that or, uh, cognitive, what, what, what does that do with that type of diet? Well, effectively, it's just bad for your brain to have elevated insulin levels over extended right. periods of time. Right. Um, you know, your brain does need some glucose. Your brain runs really off of uh, two two fuel sources. There's uh, glucose and there's ketones, which are which are basically a derivative of of fat, ketone bodies. And so you need some glucose, but your your body can create its own glucose uh, through gluconeogenesis, a process where it can turn it can turn any, you know fat or protein or or what have you into glucose. So your body's very good at mod at um maintaining good glucose levels it's when you just jam carbs into your body and overload it with what then turns into blood glucose <clears throat> that you have basically cro- <clears throat> chronically elevated uh insulin and basically your brain is overloaded with um you know glucose and insulin which not to get into too much of the physiology but effectively uh, creates more insulin, um, <clears throat> spikes certain uh, other hormones that cause you to eat, you know eat more. It just has sort of a cascading effect, um, in addition to causing you to gain weight. All of which has, you know, a myriad of downstream cognitive um, issues. It's not it's not fully understood this linkage, you know, between let's say Alzheimer's and and having elevated insulin for 50 years. And, and so the, the science is not, there's nothing definitive. If it was, it'd be on the front page of the newspaper. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's still, you know, new. And he was kind of like the whistleblower, so to speak. Um, but we're learning more and more about the literal, you know, connection between the two. And, and what type of diet do you have now? Is there, is there, is it just a low carb diet or is there a particular type of sort of diet that you follow? Yeah, I mean, it's not militant, I I wouldn't say. Like, I'm not, like, you know, writing down, like, meals I'm going to eat. I I just simply eat a low-carb diet. I'm not even fully ketogenic. I just, you know, I don't find that to be a sustainable diet. Um, You know, I think it's good to cycle in and out of if you're so inclined, depending on your goals. But I, I don't you know, I don't think it's healthy to like obsess over what you eat. It's, it's, it's fairly basic. Like just eat zero or less bread and pasta, you know, and rice and other carbohydrates. If you're going to eat carbohydrates, eat more complex carbohydrates, you know, that have fiber and things like that, that'll slow the conversion into blood glucose, but effectively eat, eat a lot of protein and fat. Um, you know, like, Um, and for the carbs that you're going to eat, eat good carbs, eat, you know, leafy green vegetables and things like that. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of it. Uh, I, I really, you know, I don't, it's not actually, you can make it really complicated, but, and, and I'm not a, I'm not, I don't follow a vegan diet either. You know, our products are vegan. Um, you know, I would say my diet is mostly plant-based, but, but I do consume things like eggs, um, so, you know, the jury's still out on that too, but mm-hmm. the, the, the beauty of it is you can just don't even take anyone's word for it. Just do it and you'll feel the difference. Like it, it becomes apparent when, when you cut carbs out that your energy level is how you feel. It, it, it becomes apparent. So I always recommend like no one should take anyone's word for it. Just do it and, and see how you feel. Awesome. So then let's go on to IQ bar. So um, again, the details you gave me were that 
it, it came from the, the 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 sort of recipe came from you tinkering, which I love the description, tinkering away at your kitchen apartment, your apartment in your kitchen with this protein bar. So so what what inspired you to want to go entrepreneurial and, and create a protein bar? We'll be back after a quick break. Hi, I'm Alex, the host of X Health Show. Meet the future of healthcare. Think X Men, that's X Health. Actual superheroes behind programming living cells to cure cancer once and for all. Tech that detects preterm delivery in seconds, brain computer interface, or apps that employ AI to match you, your disease, with the best treatment. X Health Show brings to you visionaries who push the boundaries of healthcare from Switzerland, the heart of Europe, and the most innovative innovative country in the world. Let me introduce you to their startups. Head to X Health Show, meet the future of healthcare. Happy to greet you there. Yeah, I mean, I, I did, it sounds kind of weird when I put it this way, but I, I didn't really care what it was. Um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, Uber is a transportation company with with no cars. Like mm. for, for me, it's like, it happens to be a protein bar, but really we're, you know, a brain and body nutrition company. Um, so it's like divorcing the form factor from the broader um, purpose of what we're doing. So what, what I was really interested in was my, you know, how do you make your brain work better effectively? Mm. And it just so happens that nutrition is one way to do that. Again, sleep and exercise are also ways to do that. Let they're less productizable, um, obviously, than food. So that was what I was interested in, and so everything's downstream of that interest. So it's like, okay, if 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 that's one way to make your your brain work better, what are the you know what are the actual macro and micronutrients? And it's just sort of a step by step, like, okay, it's these things. Okay, well, how can you make a product out of those things? And what sort of product is the easiest to like mash a bunch of these things together? Well, you know, the bar market's a huge market. That's probably a good place to start. You could, you know, if you want, and then it's like, okay, vitamin E, like what's the the richest thing in vitamin E, you know, well, almonds are super high in vitamin E. Okay. We'll have it be almond based, you know, what else? Like, you know, flavonoids, it's a polyphenol and colorful, you know, fruits and vegetables. Okay, great. What's highest in flavonoids? Well, blueberries are super, super high. Okay, we'll help, you know, we'll center on blueberries. It's sort of like taking just one by one, you know, what are the nutrients um, that are have been shown to be good for your brain? What ingredients are richest in those? And then let's let's create a product out of that. So it just sort of logically in a linear way led me to to pick that form factor. Um and you know, it, it's not rocket science. It's really, really tough, <laughs> way tougher than it, it probably sounds. But it's not rocket science. I can, I could figure it out literally in my kitchen. Um, so, I wanted to do something where literally I could be the creator. I'm not hiring some, you know, engineer or developer to create the thing I want to create. Like I can, I can figure it out. And. Uh... And, and what with the manufacturing now, who who does all of the manufacturing of your bars? We have a contract manufacturer in the Midwest. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's another decision point. You know, when you want to make something, either you can make it or someone else can make it. And there are pluses and minuses, right? You, as an obsessive entrepreneur, you always want maximum control, right? So, you know, that lends itself to making it yourself. But now you got to buy a bunch of machinery and lease space and hire people. And, you know, so most people go the contract manufacturer route and then Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, who's the right contract manufacturer and what are their quality controls and, you know, what's their pricing and this and that. I mean, that's one of, I would say the toughest, one of the, one of the toughest things in business is, you know, managing third parties slash partners because it's out of your control. You, You can do X, Y, Z, but ultimately it's out of your control. And so you have to like let go. And that's extremely tough for me. And I think other people. Um, so yeah, that's how we make it. Okay. Fantastic. And, um, and you built your business initially through crowdfunding. 
Yep. Why did you choose that route rather than getting some sort of investment? Well, typically, um, you know, you look at tech valuations and they're all crazy. Someone walks into a, a room, a venture capital room, and they have a slide deck and an idea and they raise $3 million on a $10 million valuation, say. Yep. Right. Which is insane to me, but, but that's like the norm. You can't do that for a physical product company. It's, it's just not possible. I mean, may, maybe some people can do it, but you know, you're a first time founder. Why is anyone trusting you? Like that's not going to happen. So, okay. If that's not going to happen, how do you not give up a huge chunk of your company, but get, you know, the money you need to get going. Hmm. Crowdfunding is a great way to do that. I mean, it solves that chicken or egg problem of, you need to create sales to justify valuation to raise money to run your business, mm. but you don't have the money needed to create those sales in the first place. Yeah. So that's like the chicken or egg problem. And it crowdfunding solves that effectively. If you can do it well, you know, if you can run a good campaign and generate, cause those are all sales. So you, mm. you know, you run a good campaign, you generate all these sales. They're kind of phantom sales, right? You're not sending product. Then you create the product and then you fulfill the orders and then you then you turn around to the investors and you say, Hey, I just generated all this, all these sales. You know, here's our valuation. And you know, this that sort of corroborates that valuation. And it just just helps you. Um, like I'm in a sales driven world versus like a you know, inspiration or te- you know, vision based world. Really all anyone cares about is like Cool, cool idea. How much did you sell? Mm-hmm. And um, do you mind sharing with us uh, how much you generated on crowdfunding? Because I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued to see the sort of level you got to through crowdfunding initially. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's publicly available. You can Google it. But it's um, we sold across Kickstarter plus Indiegogo, which is kind of like a spillover. You just keep your campaign going uh $90,000 it was the total tally over two months so, so that was we had never sold one one dollar um so in our first two months we generated $90,000 which you know it's that's a awesome sort of uh kickstart to your your business you know that's a lot of revenue really really quickly right mm-hmm. um of course it's also terrifying because now you got to fulfill everything <laughs> yes but um and what were your contributors on crowdfunding were there lots of small contributions of like ten dollars five dollars twenty dollars or was it certain people that were putting in larger chunks <laughs> that mix? no i mean it's 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 like they're like any algorithmic based setup it's it's a game. Like there, there's things that will have sort of halo effects. So a big thing in crowdfunding is you want as many, as many backers as possible. And so you want to get a lot of people in the door who are doing like five, 10, 20, $20 um, contributions because that bumps you up in the popularity on Kickstarter. You can be on the homepage of your category. Right. And then that leads to this halo effect of more people seeing you, more people buying you. So, I mean, we, the vast, vast majority are, you know, 20 bucks, 10 bucks, 30 bucks, you know, in that range, you have a people, a few people come in who are a thousand dollars or whatever, but that's, that's definitely the exception. That's really interesting. So, so now being an entrepreneur for a prolonged period, what have you learned from being an entrepreneur? Uh, I've learned I don't want to do anything else. You know, I, I've learned, I, I, again, I've, I've been on both sides. So, you know, for three and a half years, I worked long hours at a software company. I had two bosses. I traveled all the time, like saw that side of the world. Hmm. And now I've seen this side and I can have a really good comparison and I'll take this side any day of the week, you know? So um, I've learned that it's, you know, I don't want to, I don't ever want to have a boss again, okay. you know? Um, and that's just me. Like, that's just, you know, I think people, everyone has a different personality. Some people like more structure and, you know, they want a work-life balance and this and that. And I don't, I, I don't want that. I don't want either of those things. Like I, I want to like love what I do because I'm going to be doing it 10 hour, 10, 12, 14 hours a day. So, um, 
I've learned, you know, how hard it is for sure. Certainly it's way harder than my prior job. Um, you work way longer. I mean, you work every weekend. Um, and, um, you know, you deal with your, your metal is tested in almost every possible way. You know, you have, you fall out with employees, you have to hire people, you have to fire people, you run out of money and you have to, you know, it's basically just like compress a career's worth of like dramatic moments into like three, four or five, six, seven years. And, and that's, that's starting a company. You know, you have these like epic manufacturing failures and this heartbreak. And then you have this elation, you get into a new retailer it's like a movie almost, you know, and, um, but I think the probably the number one thing I've learned is 90% of the battle is just showing up the next day. Like that's it. Like the, the only way that companies die is that someone gave up. Like That's it. There's always a way out, you know? So I think, you know, you just lose hope or lose spirit and and that's when that's when when things die that's really interesting thank you for that insight um so what is your what's a day in your life are you mainly strategizing are you mainly thinking sales and marketing are you thinking investors are you thinking what what what's a normal day for you whatever is that's the other fun thing about entrepreneurship it's always different um there is no like you, know, you wake up and you tackle whatever like hectic disasters are happening that given day. And there are always disasters. Like we're living in a the worst supply chain environment. Mm. Uh, certainly I've ever seen, but I think most people would tell you they've ever seen. I mean, it's, it's insane. Um, how Why difficult. is the supply chain such a problem in the U.S. at the moment? Oh, well, it's global, but it's... Oh, okay. um, right, right, yeah. I mean, you're, people aren't getting the toys they expected for yeah. Christmas this year. People can't buy cars. Um, people can't buy. I went to Best Buy, which is a big retailer in the U.S., and they yeah. are they don't they are out of printers. Like that's like the place to go buy a printer. Like yeah, sorry, there's a chip shortage. We don't have a printer. Like it's we're going through a, just an insane moment. I mean, we buy some stuff from abroad, like some packaging elements of our our packaging. I've been stuck in Chicago for literally three months, wow. three months at the Chicago rail yard. And we can't get it out because there's a 2000 container backlog. So it's just like, um, you know, I'm dealing with stuff like that on a daily basis, yeah. just, just getting to zero, just getting to steady state where you're producing your product and you're producing enough of it mm. is like a miracle these mm. days. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's having a great team around you, um, you know, and just problem solving. It's like you wake yeah. up and you're like, here's the problem of the day. How do I most efficiently and most effectively solve that problem? It's never like I wake it's, you know, versus like, let's say a desk job, you wake up and you're like, I have to make the X, Y, Z report. And then there's these 10 steps and I'm going to do, do them all. And then my day's over and I'm going to send it out to the team. Like that is not at all what, happens <laughs> yeah how many how many is in your team how many employees do you have uh there's eight of us no and and they cover all aspects of the manufacturing process and the sales and marketing uh so i, I mostly handle the manufacturing stuff um myself i formulate the products myself i um oversee all of that and and supply chain um but yeah we have an ops slash finance guy and we have a head of sales, brick and mortar sales. We have a head of digital sales and marketing. And we have a head of content. Uh, we have a head of email and, and text message marketing. Um, we have an operations manager, uh, customer service person. So, yeah, I mean, it's it spans everything, but it's like every person has multiple hats. Um, yeah. So, and then it probably always will be that, that way. Um, well, until you start start getting to scaling and you set up systems and processes, you will have lots of generalists until you get to that point. Yeah, I'm convinced that 
we'll never get to that. Like, <laughs> I think I would try and sell the business before we get to that point where it's like, you know, I'm terrified of just growing into becoming a actual CEO. Uh, Cause that doesn't sound very fun to me, but it's a double-edged sword. That means you grew, grew a lot. So I you know, take the good with the bad. Yeah. Absolutely. And I saw on your website that you've now stocked, you've now been stocked in Walmart as well. That's, that's pretty big. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we were a digital first business. So, um, the majority of our revenue comes from online, but we've had some awesome retail partnerships emerge and Walmart's, you know, is biggest retailer in the U S. So that was an awesome win. Um, you know, comes with its own challenges. Brick and mortar is just such a different game. You have to make specific pack types and sizes. You have to figure out the, the unit economics. You have to figure out how to effectively distribute. You, know, you now have a partner that you don't want to let down. You can't let down. Um, you know, you're on a hyper competitive shelf. Like it's just, it's an entirely different game. It's, it's almost like you're running two entirely separate businesses. Um, the online versus brick and mortar. Um, but you know, you have to get good at both. You have to, uh, if you really want to scale. Awesome. Um, right. So what's your plans for the next two to five years? What, what, where do you see your business, yourself, your role developing? <sighs> That's a good question. It's, it's so hard to predict given like how the craziness of the world, but I mean, grow for one, you know, the, the, the sort of crude metric is just, let's like grow your top line revenue. Um, you know, we try to double every year. And so that's, that's kind of like a rough, like just financial goal. Um, but, you know, keep, 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 you know, doing the things needed to satisfy that growth, you know, h- hire people, uh, raise more money, um, keep rolling out new products. We're rolling out a hydration stick pack product called IQ Mix, which is um, basically a magnesium plus electrolytes uh, plus lion's mane, which is a adaptogenic mushroom uh, hydration stick pack product. So mm-hmm. it's a kind of a brain and body hydration product, whereas our bars are a brain and body uh, sustenance product. And so we'll keep rolling out new into new categories, all under the IQ, you know, insert, you know, fill in the blank um, uh, umbrella. And so we'll try to we'll try to succeed in multiple categories. You know, we've had some some good success in bars, and let's see if we can replicate that in hydration and coffee and sleep and other functional areas that aren't cannibalizing each other. And um, you know, ultimately grow the, grow the business to a decent size and, and sell the business. Um, you, know, you always want to, you think it's foolish to not, uh, you have to have a goal right at the end and, um, and then work backwards from that goal. So do you want to do this your whole career? Do you want to do this your whole life? You know, yes, no, the, the answer is that it will lead you to do very different things on a daily and weekly basis. So you know, that's definitely the, the end goal, but, um, you know, we have to go out and make it happen. Absolutely. And there's something earlier you said about that you're using the bars as a tool for brain function, brain nutrition. So do you have a mission statement? Do you have something that you sort of that sort of permeates all through your bars, hydration, et cetera? Is there, is there a mission statement? We do. It's not, it needs to be more fleshed out, but effectively our purpose is we want to empower the doers is, is kind of like the, the moniker we, we put on the, the people who consume our product. And it's, you know, you have certain brands where it's like, we're the outdoors brand or we're the hiker brand or we're the, you know, weightlifter brand. And we're really the brand for everyday doers, like a mom, you know, juggling, 10 different things like a guy working late at the office, um, you you know, as well as athletes um, trying to perform at a high level mentally and physically, but it's really every day, you know, ambitious people. How do we, we exist to empower them to do more Um, basically displace 
unhealthy sustenance with functional healthy sustenance, which enables them to live more productive lives effectively. So you know, that's kind of the vision behind the company. You can get really in the weeds around, well, we have a low glycemic impact and this and that. But what's, the, what's the point at the end of the day? It's, it's that you can do the things you want to do and not be lethargic and feel better on a daily basis. Amazing. Thank you. Um, right, we're coming to the end of the interview. I ask the same six questions to all of my guests. They're quick fire questions. They don't need a quick fire answer. Uh, first question is, what's the best decision that you made? The best decision I made? It's a good one. Probably hiring my then girlfriend, now fiance. That was probably the best decision. And, and I think a lot of people would say, well, that's, that's pretty dicey, you know. What does she do um, in your business? She runs our our e-commerce business and marketing program. But yeah, I mean that's that's something people don't talk about enough, I think, which is like the personal how how does the personal mesh with the professional with entrepreneurship? I mean, people yeah. who are entrepreneurs often get divorced or have relationship issues or, you know, cuz you're effectively like this thing takes over your life, uh, yeah. which is the, the business and um, I was lucky enough to have a significant other who was happened to be really good at something I needed help with. Um, and it's just kind of, you know, it has it just like anything, it has its ups and downs, but, um, it's fun to have like a partner in the life. That's also a partner in business. Right. Um, so long as both of you care and are competent, you know, you never want to be like, you know, I never want to feel like it's nepotistic, um, but it's it's just worked out really well. Awesome. Uh, what's the best piece of advice you've been given? <clears throat> the best piece of advice I've been given is probably don't chase trends or don't. I think people are obsessed with whatever is like sexy or the trend of the moment. And I think it's a terrible idea Uh, in the long run, you know, things work out, things work out like they should. Uh, I've found, you know, if you get obsessed with whatever it is, Bitcoin or raising a lot of money from this, you know, venture capital company or this particular diet or whatever, um, rather than staying true to your original mission, you could be in a really, you know, unsexy industry, uh, but you're so convinced that this is the right tool to build or service build. And, and I think people get distracted along the way or they say, well, this other guy just raised a bunch of money over here. Or this other guy pivoted in this way. And, you know, they lose sight of what was originally a a good mission and idea and concept and um, they get distracted. I guess the net net of that is avoid distractions, have a singular focus. And the only other, other answer I'd give that is be product obsessed. Like there, if you create a great product, it will succeed period. Like the vast majority of products are not great products but if you like there's this new concept of product-led growth you can grow simply based off your product being superb um it might take longer than you wanted or, or what have you but if you can just think 24 hours a day about your product and how to make it two three four percent better like you will you will win awesome who's helped you most in your career Um, that's a good one. I mean, I would say, you know, I would say early advisors slash investors. Honestly, it's a tough one because you have to help yourself so much more than anyone helps you. Like your self-talk, because it happens all day long, right? Mm -hmm. Versus having a call with someone once a month or once every two weeks, right? 
like the ratio of like your relationship with yourself is like versus your relationship to any outside person is like 100 to one. Right. So yeah. getting your, your own head in the right place and your own self-talk in the right place, I think is, mm-hmm. is so much more important, but se- secondarily, you know, having great people who believe in you, like who believe in you more than even the product or the company or whatever yeah. is really important because it, that helps your relationship with yourself too because you get more confident these people believe in you you know there's obviously it's helpful when people uh honestly i find most of it's like psychological it's like support based there is some help you know they introduced you to xyz person or they gave you this resource and that's good and well but i find most things you could have found yourself or figured out yourself it's mostly like the psychological support and check-ins and it's almost like therapy um to have check-ins with people and it's it's just convinced convinces you that you're not crazy Um, do you have any regrets (sighs) uh i yeah i think i think we should have stayed focused longer and i think we should have and when I say we, I mean I. Um, I should have been more product obsessed earlier. You know, there's so many things you have to do with a business. Mm. Set up a website, you know, all the legal stuff, packaging, this, that. If you just spend tw- twice or three times longer having a really good product, creating a really airtight product, mm. And being really focused, you know, when I say focus, I mean, like, for example, just being D to C on your website, like, don't go chase that shiny retailer. Don't, don't just chase any dollar of revenue from the beginning. Um, I think I would have saved a lot of heartache. Of course, it's a lot easier said than done. Um, yeah. And hindsight's a, 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 a good thing for those sorts of reflections, aren't they? Yeah. But you know, some retailer knocks on your door and, they say, hey, we can put you in all these places and the, the check will be this big. You know, as a 26-year-old first-time entrepreneur, you're like, hell yeah. You kind of like, you had a whole plan. They weren't in the plan, but you mm-hmm. say yes anyway. And it's just really hard to have discipline and say no. Um, so. Thank you. Those are the big ones. What are you most proud of? I think I'm most proud of, uh, you know, building something that supports eight people. You know, that's a cool thing, you know, it's an entity and those people wouldn't, you know, would be doing other things, but you created this thing that supports a group of people. You know, ultimately it's like, you can't, you max out on what you can do. You need other people to succeed no matter what which is always tough for an entrepreneur because every entrepreneur is a control freak. But, you know, nothing really hums until you have an actual legit team. Um, I think I'm proud of making tough decisions on, on the team as well. You know, that I think if you ask people, like, you know, do you regret hi- fi- firing that person? They almost never say no. So some something like letting someone go, it's, it's terrible and it's uncomfortable and you dread it. I've never heard someone say they regretted, they regretted firing someone, not, not once, which means that it's virtually always the right decision. Right. But the problem is you, you dragged it out for two years. You, drag, you, know, you could have done it in six months. And that's not good for anyone, including the, that person. Yeah. So I think I'm proud of, of making tough, tough team decisions like that as as well. Yeah, it's hard. I I, I get that. I get that. that sacking people for it's it's a really hard thing to be able to do, and having those conversations, they can be definitely awkward and, and difficult. So I I definitely empathise with that. Um, what does legacy mean to you? Nothing. <laughs> At the moment. Yeah, nothing. It doesn't mean anything to me. But I don't really believe in legacy. I believe in the uh, Jeff Bezos kind of quote, every day is day one. 
Like if you don't treat every day, like day one, then you're not going to win. So the second you start thinking about legacy and, you know, oh, I'm cool now because I grew us to this size, you lose sight of that just dogged hunger and drive and that day one mentality. So I, I try not to think about it at all. I try to think about like, how do I win today and tomorrow and next week? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think you, 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 it is healthy once in a while, every whatever, six months, you stop and you look back and you're like, damn, that was cool. You know, we, we just did X, Y, and Z. Yeah. But, and you, you know, you have a, a beer or two and you celebrate, but then the next day you, you wake up and you do it, you know, you're back at it. Awesome. And and lastly, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you? Sure. Um, you, know, you can, uh, you can email me at will at eatiqbar.com. Hopefully that doesn't uh, deluge my inbox, but, um, but yeah, I mean, we, our website's eatiqbar.com and our, our social media handle is at eatiqbar um, on Instagram. And yeah, if you're in Boston, uh, shoot me an email. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Will. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Yeah, pleasure's mine. Thanks. Thanks.